train that goes straight, but the train's probably longer than drive, right? Didn't you take I, the train I, oh, yeah. up here, Richard? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, train is not a good option if you're wanting to, to make time. <sighs> I mean, Suck you it up, Ronan. Suck it take, up. Take off Friday and Monday and drive up on Friday, hang out with us Saturday, Sunday, drive home Monday. There you go. Solved. Problem solved. Well, the, un unless I have work that weekend. <laughs> we'll just request it off now. Well, like it, it, I, it's, it's months in advance. Yeah, I, but I don't want to take. I don't want to request that time off, and then you know, oh well, it turns out you didn't have to apply your off days to a weekend you were already off. But, well, okay, a, so then, well, are you telling me? Are you telling me that your supervisor, your job? would still take leave days away from you if you weren't scheduled on those days anyway? I do not know. I'd have to... Because that's some fuck. <laughs> I don't know. I would have to ask. Yeah, I would just ask your supervisor and be like, hey, I'm planning a trip. Um, if I am going to be scheduled that weekend, can I just reschedule that for another weekend? Yeah. Like, <laughs> if I was planning to work that weekend, can you just slot me in on a different weekend? Yeah. Because I, I know I like I work I work one weekend and then I'm off the next two. Like I worked last weekend, which would turn out to only be the Saturday. They didn't call me in on Sunday. But uh just just tell your boss that hey, you know, work your schedule magic to make sure that's the weekend I have off. And also I'm taking off uh, Friday and Monday. <laughs> just start making demands. Just, just, just throw your dick around, a, Ronan. Yeah, they, they, need, they, they need you more than you need them. <laughs> That's I'm true. Totally not there a, are HVAC I, jobs everywhere. <laughs> I'm totally not just a cog in the machine. Okay. Are we ready to start this? Yeah, sure. All right. Five, four, three, two. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Jupiter's Croc, where we are on a 39... Still a great name. Yeah, yeah, it's a great name. We're on a 39-episode journey through the crazy, wild, sex-filled, um, violent... Mongrel world. on Mongrel! Yes, uh, world of Spartacus. Uh, my name is Matthew. Joining me uh, are my fellow mongrels down there in Memphis is Ronan. Yep, yep, I'm, I'm here. And, uh, as always, Steve, also known as Plotticus. Yep, I am here once again. I watched this episode twice because it is so good. Yeah, spoiler. I, I watched it twice as well, but I fell asleep when the commentary was playing. Yeah, I watched it twice, once with, with and without the commentary track on it, and it was just as good both times. Uh, so this episode, we're on episode 5 now of uh, Spartacus Blood and Sand, and if you listen to our previous episode, you will know that that's the first episode of this series that we're like, okay, we're all on board. It's that's all... the turning point. Yeah, we're like, yeah. it's it's is that going to be the high, and it's going to be a slow downward slope, or are we going to find something better? Um, now we're on episode 5. This one's called Shadow Games. Plotticus take it away all right so there are there are two concurrent storylines uh more than that really but there's two big storylines uh running through this episode and so i'm going to uh talk about them separately because i'll never be able to keep track of them otherwise uh so story one let's talk about what are uh ronin sucks for going all in i kind of want to go all in too but i'm not i'm gonna fold uh the main storyline for this episode is what's going on with Princess Suck it, and bitches! Spartacus. <laughs> yep, I made I made the correct decision getting out of that. Anyway, didn't you have a flush? Uh, huh? Yeah, you had a flush. You had a flush, man. Well, you had five I had, diamonds. I just, I just saw seven two, and <laughs> I was like, I have to go all in. Has per arrangements. No, it's seven two offsuit. So you, you failed. You you did the improper arrangements. Yes. But I you saw failed. seven two you and I fu failed. I fucking won that hand. Give me that. I won that fucking hand. Say Anyways, it. Anyways, let's talk about Spartacus. Say it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm still talking about Spartacus. Uh, Spartacus has been returned to gladiator training. 
Uh, he, his time in the pits is done. He has come to an understanding with Badiatis. Uh, he, he's back out uh, in, in the, the training grounds, and he's practicing with Crixus. And Crixus is not taking any of Spartacus's shit because Crixus is just going all in. Uh, trying to beat the fuck out of Spartacus. Uh, so he knocked Spartacus Sparta. down. And uh, Doc Tori tried to get him to calm down, or to try to get them to, like, switch, or basically stop fighting Spartacus and go do something else. And uh, Crixus just ignores him. And then when, when Doc Tori chastises him, Crixus's response is, sorry, I didn't mean to scare the rabbit. <laughs> which is just fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I think this is the first time he calls him a rabbit, which become that becomes one of uh, Crixus's go-to insults is calling somebody a rabbit. Yeah. Well, it's great because you're, you're both rabbits in my book. Uh, <laughs> He's still Badiatis, upset about that hand. I don't even know what you're talking about. Badiatis uh, is it, there's a drought, and there's been a drought throughout this entire series to this point, uh, and Badiatis is, like, praying and also, like, chastising the gods, telling them, you know, make it just fucking rain, for God's sake. Jupiter's sakes. cock. Make it rain. Uh, and so, to make the drought go away, you find out that the magistrate is going to have games. Uh, another uh, another gladiator uh, battle and the magistrate is on its way is on his way to Badiatis's Ludus, which can Sacrifice only mean one thing. For the gods. Yep, uh, this can only mean one thing. Uh, the magistrate wants to get someone from Badiatis's Ludus to fight in the Prionus, the main event, whatever you want to call it. And uh, Badiatis figures this out, and he hears that hey, the magistrate's on the way. And he goes out to greet him, and who does he see? Good Salonius. Good Salonius. And so. Uh, the magistrate and Salonius go follow Badiatis out to uh, out out to uh, the the training yard, or I guess like the, the podium or the little place like overlooking the uh, the gladiator training ar arena. And so they're going to have Crixus fight in the main event. Crixus versus Salonius's man, but we don't know Salonius's man yet. And then Salonius, uh, that that skeezy guy, he he didn't tell anyone. He didn't tell Badiatis who his person is. And so when when uh, Badiatis points to Crixus, the Magistrate and Salonius are going to be are like, yes, it'll be a battle between legends. And Badiatis is like, wait, legends? That implies there are two legends that'll be in this fight. Who is the other legend, pray tell? Turns out it's Theocles, the Shadow of Death. <laughs> now, I think this might be the first time that, you've really, that we've really heard about uh, Theocles in Blood and Sand, but if you did what we did and started with Gods of the Arena, uh, you know that Theocles is basically the guy that ended uh, Onimaeus, Doctore's like, gladiator career, essentially. Uh, the Theocles only one to fought... survive against him. Yes. The, the story is, Theocles fought a hundred people in the arena, and Onimaeus is the only one to survive, and he didn't win his fight. He just lasted long enough, apparently, to receive mercy and and, and not be executed. Uh, I think it, like so, it, they, they're not super clear on what exactly happened to how Onimaeus survived. Did it come across to you guys that Theocles let him live out of respect, or that the Romans did? Because it doesn't seem like when Theocles is presented here that he's going to be, you know, nice to anybody. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. They, I didn't assume mercy. I, I assumed yeah, uh, that I assumed that Theocles had Onimaeus down, was ready to execute him, finish him off, and then whoever was running the game said, "You know, let us be merciful." Thumbs up. I wish and they so Onimaeus got to live. That's possible, but of course, now that I think about it, and knowing what we know about gods of the arena, uh, for example, like like. Uh, hundred men they say he's made a hundred fortunes at this point he's a free man he has to be he's not yeah. like he uh, yeah, I know the game. <laughs> yeah like they say Salonius just kind of like you know more or less like convinced them to come out of retirement for some extra coin but like he's a free man right so like it's very possible that when he had that match against Onimaeus like you know it was just him he didn't have to listen to you know he, like he didn't have like a, a uh, a dominus to tell him like no stop yeah because so, this would have been yeah. five six years prior because in gods of the arena onimaeus is recovering from his injuries to theocles so no part of theocles 
made me believe that he would grant mercy of his own volition. Right. So they, again, they, they don't yeah. they don't show it, but I'm I'm under the impression that the organizers of the games uh, gave a thumbs up, and so he spared Animaeus. Okay. Yeah, th that was my original thought, but yeah, I don't know. I could be swayed either way. Th the problem is the show gives us nothing, so this is pure wild rampant speculation. I will not hear criticism of this show, good sir. <laughs> Unless it's the first three episodes, right? Speaking of good, yeah, I, had I had actually forgotten how sleazy Good Salonius is. Because, um, you know, I, for, for whatever reason, my mind always goes to other things in this first season. And had we not um, gotten all that backstory of Salonius and how Badiatis fucked him over, over and over and over and over again, I, I think that sort of puts the nail in the coffin in terms of our sort of, hey, should you watch Gods of the Arena first? I think you I think you need that backstory to to Salonius. Otherwise he's just a generic one note sleazy guy. Yeah, you don't Salonius is not in the first five or six episodes of Blood and Sand, like hardly at all. Like you see him greet Xena in the marketplace. Uh, there's mentions of Salonius uh, early on and you see him here. Like he's he's not a big player. Not yet. No, yeah, like he's a side character in in Blood and Sand. He he's he's not a, he's only a major player in the prequel show. But I would I would still kind of argue against that and say like I I kind of think it's better if you go in the other direction because that, it does what a good prequel should do and it does give you more backstory to what was a background character. All right, well let's yeah, we're, we're never gonna get through this episode. All right, so. <laughs> Uh, when Badiatis hears that Theocles is going to fight, Badiatis says, well, uh, if we want to honor the gods, we need to make sure the match is fair. And, you know, we all know Theocles' is, uh, his reputation. Uh, he needs to fight more than one man. Like, to balance the scales, it needs to be a two-on-one match. And so Salonius takes this opportunity to get revenge on Spartacus. Remember in episode one, Spartacus kills four of Salonius' gladiators. And so when, when Badiata says, you know, I, I want two of my guys in the ring, Salonius says, yeah, well, how about your man Spartacus? And so they all agree to this. So the the Primus, Spartacus just fucked his life up a couple episodes ago by, like, weaseling his way into a Primus, and now he's back in one. But the main event is going to be Crixus and Spartacus against Theocles. And so now it is... Uh, up to Doctore to train the two of them for the fight. And so In Doctore, like three days. Yes. Uh, Doctore like, originally like, goes to, to Body Odyssey and says, like, you know, they, they can't do this. Let me fight. Like, I, I have a, a, a debt of blood to pay to Theocles. And Body Odyssey, uh shuts him down and says, no, train Spartacus and Crixus. And Doctore says, I don't think any amount of training is going to help. And so Body Odyssey just says, then prepare them to die. Prepare them for a glorious for a death. glorious death. <laughs> and Xena is horrified at this. Like... Xena is horrified. And that's that's because she has been sleeping with Crixus for five or six years now. And so uh, I don't want to talk about it now because I want to get through the story. But a question for later is: Does Xena actually have feelings for Crixus yes. at this point, or is Crixus just her favorite toy? I had that same still, thought. She absolutely still treats him like a slave. But, and yet, she shows jealousy uh, when other people are interested in him. Anyways, uh, we're going to come back to that later because we, we got to finish the synopsis. Uh, so Doctor A gets to work uh, trying to get Spartacus and Crixus on the same on the same page. It's not working. Badiatis has a discussion with Spartacus and says, you know, hey, if if you die, I can't help you. Fi I can't find your wife. And also, if you die and Crixus dies as well, like, this Ludus will never recover, and then I extra can't help you find your life, so you, Spartacus, need to take it upon yourself to figure out how to work with Crixus. And so, Spartacus actually tries to make amends with Crixus throughout this episode, and Crixus is just not having it. Uh, Spartacus goes to Crixus's, like, room, for lack of a better term, for and Crixus just... It, does not want to listen to anything Spartacus says. Spartacus keeps trying and trying. 
and they have this really great conversation where uh, they, they talk about how Crixus fights to honor the house of Badianus, whereas Spartacus is just fighting to leave. And Spartacus says, no, you fight because you're a slave and you don't yeah. have any choice. And this is Crixus the first time we really get that from Spartacus, the slave stuff. Yes. And, and Crixus, for his part, seems to be okay with that. He's like, I know my place. I know I'm a slave and I don't actually have any choice, but... He just the wants only glory thing, in the, arena. the only thing I have going for me is the pursuit of glory, and so I, I, I'm controlling what I can control, which is my fate in the arena. And uh, Crixus goes on to say some terrible things about Spartacus's wife that I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> and so they get into another fight. Who would have thought that Crixus and Spartacus continue to fight throughout the series? Uh, but Doc Crazy. Crazy's had enough. Uh, it's weird to think, because Crixus is the, the champion of Capua, the, the undefeated Gaul, and you see Doc Torre basically toying with him. This is, On Emmaus, it's not something, it's, he's the yes. best in the Ludus. He's the best. It's not something that you really catch if you're not paying attention, but On Emmaus could kill all of these other gladiators <laughs> just in an instant if he wanted to. He is so awesome. Yep. Uh, but Spartacus... And Crixus cannot get on the same page, and so Doc Tori's like, fine, if, it, if, you know, me training you isn't helping, how about I just give you an example? And so he takes off his, uh, his, I don't know, gladiator trainer armor that he's got on. He's got, he's covered in scars. And so he tells them about his fight with the Shadow of Death. And he says that basically... Every time I press, any time I attack... The Shadow of Death attacked and got me. Anytime I retreated to get some space between the two of us, the Shadow of Death fucking got me. And so Spartacus and Crixus are like, what do we do then? You're telling me that he that he has no weaknesses. He can attack when he, then when he's being attacked and also when he goes on the attack. And so Animaeus says, there's two of you. You have to do both at once. You have to attack and defend at the same time. You, you have to attack and distract at the same time, meaning that when you know Spartacus is... Uh, got his shield up, Crixus needs to be going in and whatnot. Basically, work together or die separately is what uh, Animaeus is saying. Work as one or die as two. Yep. And so, uh, that, that, that finally seems to make things start to click. And so later on, Crixus and Spartacus have another heart to heart, uh, and where they talk about they continue to talk about you know Crixus is fighting for glory, but Spartacus is fighting for his wife. Uh, what kind of makes Crixus uh, come around is he finally gets to sleep with Navia at this point. Uh, while all this is going on, uh, Xena and Alithia, who is back, thumbs up. <laughs> Oh. They come back. Uh, Alithia comes also. back. Alithia comes back. <laughs> that woman and, uh, knows how to wear a dress. Wow. She does. She also <laughs> knows how to not wear one, and it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is this is a, like yet another side story that we'll we'll come back to. But uh, the long story short is Xena tries to get uh, one last night of uh, sex from Crixus, and Crixus is just he he. He can't do it because his mind is on the fight. And uh, that makes Xena very sad because she just basically took the ancient Roman equivalent of a fertility drug and she's trying to get pregnant like immediately. Yeah. Uh, she's only got a one hour time populate limit. within yeah. the hour. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Crixus uh, basically yeah, pleads with her, like, please, not tonight. I'm focused. But then he immediately goes and sleeps with Navia. Uh, which well, is awesome. here's the thing. Did he actually sleep with her or did they just kind of like make out? Because they don't actually I think show they just a made sex out. scene. Yeah, they All don't right. show I mean, a they sex scene. Whichever. Uh, the point is, Crixus shuts down Xena to get with Xena's uh, like main slave. I'm going to do something stupid and go all in. Lucy Lawless uh, in that scene, by the way, is awesome. Like when she starts yeah. crying and everything. And you can tell, like, uh, She's got some feelings for this guy. She does not want him to die. I think there's a, I think yeah. there's a little bit of love there between them. And so I guess the, the, Crixus this doesn't talk feel about. Anything. Yeah, we can talk about what's happening with Xena here. Uh, Alithia wants a private showing of Crixus and Spartacus, and Alithia takes the opportunity to kind of just tease and shit all over Spartacus. Uh, but then she is very interested in Crixus, and. Uh, 
Xena is trying to use her friendship with Alithia to get Sparta to get Crixus out of the Primus. Xena thinks Crixus is gonna die. Like as good as he is, he cannot beat the Shadow of Death. Uh, but Crixus says no. I like, I want this fight, which makes Xena and Navia very sad. Uh, but in repayment for for this private viewing of Crixus, Alithia is going to call in uh, some medical person, it's wise like a woman, weird midwife sort of thing that has yeah, the uh, knows like the some, juices some, to yeah to help you it, get it's pregnant. It's a a woman who basically prescribes fertility treatments and so Xena you know we're six seven years on now Xena has been sleeping with both Crixus and her husband routinely and she's never been pregnant and so uh, there's a scene where Alithia and Xena are are in this room and Xena is forced to reveal that she's been sleeping with someone else which excites Alithia Alithia wants all the gossip and uh but she doesn't come out and say it's Crixus. Uh, regardless, this woman says, okay, well, now that I, I know that you've been sleeping with two men, you've never been pregnant, that means the problem is you and, and not, you know, the, the men you've been sleeping with. And so she gives Xena some special tea and a winged dick candle. And she tells him, okay, this, this, candle, this candle is going to burn out in an hour. You have to have sex before this candle goes out in order for... Uh, for this to work, and then she—that's when she goes to Crixus, and Crixus unfortunately can't have it. Now uh, I got, is, I got one point. His, his to, heart's just not in it. One point to mention yeah, here: Th this is the one part that I thought was a little wrong, like a flaw, a minor flaw with this episode. Is I don't believe that Alithia, because because Bodyatus is gone, right? So Alithia knows, like she's got to fuck somebody within the hour. Who's she gonna fuck? Because she can't call Bodyatus back. I don't believe that Alithia would just leave and say, well, tell me later what happened here. I think that that was a little convenient, too convenient for me. Yeah, I don't know. I can no, see no, that. I'm fine with it. I don't feel like that character would do that. Anyways, yeah. the point is, uh, Xena has to have sex before the dick candle burns out. She goes to Crixus, and Crixus's heart is not in it. So, and then, so when Crixus shuts her down, uh, Xena in the background is like crying, like she knows, like I, I wasted this, this gift, this opportunity that was finally going to give I and Badiatis a kid, even though you know he wasn't gonna know it, it wasn't his. Uh, but she's crying. She is so good in this scene. Like yeah. she, she wants to fuck Crixus. She wants to have a baby, regardless of whose baby it is. But she also cares enough about Crixus to not harm him because Crixus says like love makes a man weak like it, he basically implies like if we fuck I'm going to die in the arena tomorrow <laughs> and Cena <laughs> respects that and death, so Cena. and and lets him go but she knows that she missed her opportunity and so she's crying so that's what's happening with Xena and Alithia there's also another scene where uh Crixus and Spartacus are just being observed by Xena and Alithia, and Alithia takes the opportunity again to shit on Spartacus. Uh, but then when it's just Crixus, because Bodyatus calls Spartacus away, uh, Alithia uh, wants Crixus to get naked, and so Bodyatus tells him, you know, remove your subtle area, your your gladiator underwear, and he just does it, and Alithia is impressed. But then you get Bodyatus is like, it, 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 we don't have a whole lot of context at this point, but you know what you know what happened in Gods of the Arena if you watch that first, and you could just see like the look in Bodyatus's eyes is just like again we're we're doing the sex shows yeah. again in the house of Bodyatus. <laughs> uh, but anyways, that's that's what's happening with. Uh, Xena and Alithia and Spartacus and Crixus. The other story that's going on is <laughs> so dense. There's so there's so much going on in this episode. The, this episode. So before we talk about the final fight, the other storyline that's going on is Bodyatus is trying to figure out who put the hit on him in the previous episode, and so Barka and Asher are sent out to investigate. And in the last episode, they saw that the people that tried to kill Badiatis were slaves, and there's a specific mark on the, the slave's shoulder. Uh, and so Asher and Barca are hauling around just this chunk of man shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they take it to this, this 
kind of <laughs> crusty looking guy and they there's there's a, a tattoo on the shoulder uh and so they ask hey uh who's whose mark is this and uh, the guy is refusing to, he says, oh, this mark is unknown to me. And Asher says, per perhaps a closer look. And so Barka shoves the guy's head down in this maggot-infested chunk of person shoulder. Mealworms. And so, <laughs> Those are mealworms. And, and whatever. It, it's gross. And they pull him up, and like he's got like a mouthful of like worm-slash-maggot mush. He's like, oh, you're, you know what? This does ring a bell. And so he <laughs> tells Asher and Barka, uh, this slave owner, uh, this particular slave owner, this is his mark. And so Asher and Barka return to Badiatis. Badiatis says, bring the slave owner to me because we need to know, we need to know who purchased these slaves to find out who put the hit on me. And so Barka and, uh, Asher go and kidnap the guy and Badiatis just beats this guy. He has just a fucking cup and he beats this motherfucker and he at the, at the whole time he's beating him he's yelling you fucking suck you suck fucking cocksucker fuck <laughs> and basically like if we you look at asher if we were asher previously... and face they are horrified they're like oh my yes. god <laughs> if we weren't previously age restricted we are now just by quoting a fraction of the body artist rant in the scene not uh, my fault Woo! 100 percent ron's fault uh but the guy reveals it's ovidius like this should not be a shot to anyone, because Ovidius is the main person that Badiatis owes money to, and Badiatis has been dodging him for several episodes now. Uh, but Badiatis and Barca and Asher, they go to Ovidius's villa. They kill everyone there, uh, except for his kid. And then Ovidius shows up and sees all of the bodies, and he sees that his kid is still alive. And this kid has these, like, soulless, lifeless doll eyes. This creepy demon child. Like a doll eyes. Uh, <laughs> Ovidius, so, uh, Ovidius tells Badiatis that, like, yes, I put the hit out on you, but I, I was doing it on someone else's orders. And Badiatis says, if you tell me who put, who, you know, actually orchestrated all this, I promise I won't kill you. And so the guy says, he swears to the gods. He won't kill yep, he swears to the gods that I, Badiatis, will not uses. kill you. Yes, <laughs> it, it's a very much a Doctor Doom promise. Uh, so uh, Ovidius says, Salonius did it. Salonius paid what you owed me, paid paid off Badiatis' debt, and said, and then said, in return, I want you to kill Badiatis. And so Ovidius puts plan into place, and. Um, Badiatis thanks him for telling him, and so Ovidius says, so now you're not going to kill me, right? And Badiatis says, correct, I'm not going to kill you. My slave is going to kill you, and so then Barca kills him. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Badiatis tells Barca to burn the, place the burn the place down and take care of the child. Now, we don't see what actually happened to this child, and what happens to the child becomes a plot point in later episodes, but as of now, we don't know. You see, you so see there Barca's are. face, right? Barca, yeah, Barca when he gets the order, Barca does not want to do this. Yeah, it's like this is a step too far, man. And there's there's also a, a Barca, the the most well-regarded gladiator who does no gladiator fighting in this entire show. He is in a relationship with the Red RPM Ranger. And he goes, he keeps coming and going from the Ludus on Badiatis' orders, and when he, go, when he goes back one time and then goes to leave, uh, Red Ranger says, you're not even going to talk to me? And Bark is like, I have nothing to say. Like, you know what's going on here. And so they, they, they have a little moment to themselves. So Barca uh, has some something going on here. Like, his Barca's love life has more of a place in the show than Barca the Gladiator. Uh, but he tells the Red Ranger to mind the birds, and then we see Naeus give this really creepy look to the Red Ranger, which is yeah. another terrible thing the show is going to pay off later on. I'll also point out there's a sub subplot with with Barca and Asher, where Asher takes a huge bet because Asher's like they're going to fucking yes. die. Crixus is going to die, and Asher's super excited because he's like Crixus is finally going to get fucked for good. I'm going to be rid of Crixus, my enemy. And Bark is like, look, dude, anybody who's bet against Crixus has lost. I'm gonna put it all on Crixus and Spartacus. And Asher's like, well, that's that works for me. 
<laughs> yep. There's plots and plots and subplots and subplots. So uh, Barca hears that the odds are heavily against Crixus and Spartacus, and so Barca says, I'll take some of that action. Uh, and then later on, Asher goes to Spartacus and says, hey, uh, just I've got something, I've got some evidence, I've got something to share with you. And, uh, oh, fucking flush. You suck. Uh, <laughs> Asher says, hey, I've got some advice for you. And and Spartacus says, uh, you know, what cost? And Spartacus kind of knows the game with Asher now. And so but Asher says, I'll give you this advice for free. And so Asher kind of lays out, the, at this point, Gods of the Arena, the show hasn't happened yet. Uh but this is where Asher reveals that Crixus is actually the one that injured Asher. So it, Asher has had this, like, a busted leg for five or six years now at this point. We saw how the actual injury happened in Gods of the Arena, but we had not seen it yet in Blood and Sand. And so Spartacus is like, wait a minute, Crixus did this? So Crixus would turn on another gladiator in the house of Badiatus? And Asher's like, yep, yeah. sure would. Well, and this you is know actually... that a point to Ronin's uh, uh, a point for Ronin here because Ronin said well it might be actually better to watch Blood and Sand first at this point we don't know if Asher's actually lying or not about this right because we know he's a really creepy sort of skeezy guy uh, he can't be trustworthy so when he tells Spartacus well Crixus did this to me you can't trust Crixus if we don't have the foreknowledge of uh, gods of the arena uh, you go into it so like well is he lying or is he true? Is he trying to get Spartacus to turn on Crixus and that's all going to be turned out to be bullshit? So, yeah, another point towards yeah, Ronin for that. It's the best kind, too, of, like, worm-tongue kind of bullshit. It's it's true conspiracy theory, kind of. This guy should have been on the boards posting Q drops and shit because it's a, it's a lie that is also true. Like, Crixus but what did part that to him. Like, Crixus d did that to him, but Crixus didn't do it to turn on him, per se. <laughs> uh, yeah, was he just... was trying to get the glory of the kill for himself. Yeah, see, I, yeah. I thought it was more interesting that everything that Asher said was true, but at the same time, Asher is telling Spartacus this because the truth furthers Asher's goals. Asher wants Spartacus to die now, Spartacus and Crixus to die now, because then he doesn't have to pay Barca. Yeah. Well, it's, it is, but he's also omitting the context of why Crixus did it to him. I don't see how the, how the context matters. Crixus wanted the glory for himself back in Gods of the Arena. Crixus also wants the glory of killing Theocles himself at this point in time. That's true. No, I do. That's true. Yeah, and I do also. It's like when he, because the uh, Asher also tells him, it's like even if it was Barca, if Barca came between him and a win, he would like he would totally kill Barca, to, to get his win. Uh, it's like that. Like yeah, it's like that's that's definitely uh, that, that's definitely a true dynamic I that. too. Yes. Yeah, I think <laughs> every I think in this one scene, everything that Bar that everything that Asher said was one hundred percent correct. Uh, Asher is a fantastic villain, and there's just more good stuff, more but, good yeah. slash terrible. But had we <laughs> not seen Gods of the Arena, we would not know. That's my point. We would not know whether or not Asher was being truthful or not in that moment. Yeah, I don't know. I I think I still I still think it would be an interesting experience if we if someone got a cut of Gods of the Arena that removed the blood and sand spoilers and then watched yeah. them in, in chronological order. Anyways, uh, that's, that's a whole separate conversation. All right, so I, are we caught up? Is there anything else we need to talk about before we talk about the final fight? We can talk about Alithia's breasts some more if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, They're great. I've got the Fantastic. internet. I don't... I don't... I want uh, to have you two on the call when we're well, <laughs> when I'm thinking about that. <laughs> I, I, I did want to bring up one thing about uh, Elithia's breasts. So when the, when she pops out, I mean she's literally popping out all over the place. Major spillage. No, because I listened to the audio commentary track, and uh, and Lucy Lawless backs me up on this, so I'm okay. I'm not going to get canceled here. Um, I actually found it very distracting. <laughs> It's so like, geez, like her breasts are like so front and center. And on the audio commentary track, um, Lucy Lawless is on this one, and she actually she makes brings a comment it up. about the titties. Too. She brings it up, and she says the director of this episode. He was a first time director on on Spartacus. He did a bunch of other episodes, but this is the first it's, one that he did. It's, yeah, the director of this uh, episode is uh, Eolus. 
It's, yeah. it's Michael Hurst from Hercules. Yeah, and apparently, I, Steve, I just kind of looked him up. Uh, you might be interested to know, he did a bunch of stuff with Power Rangers, uh, voices and stuff, and he directed yeah. Power Rangers Dino Fury. I don't know what that is, but um, he did six <laughs> episodes like the, of that. That's, I, think the, I think that's the current Power Rangers episode. Okay, well, uh, we got your Power Rangers connection there. And, yeah, there, and, like I said, there are multiple Power Ranger connections throughout the series. Yeah, and Lucy Lawless points out, she's like, Michael, I remember specifically trying to ask you something about this scene, and you would not stop staring at Viva's boobs. <laughs> and he was like, what? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? I don't remember that. And she's like, yes, I was trying to talk to you. And it's like you were so distracted by her voluptuous spillage that you weren't listening to me at all. Uh, and then he, and then she goes, but that's okay, because they're amazing. They're great. <laughs> She's like, who, who would not look at them? So, uh, Zeno... Who amongst you would not look at them titties? <laughs> I wanted to throw that tidbit in. I thought that was the funniest part of the audio commentary. All right, let's talk about the final fight. Yeah. Uh, so, Spartacus and and Crixus are about to have this battle and they have this moment before the fight uh, and this is this is basically the day after uh, or the, uh, the, the, the Crixus has first had some alone time with Navy. I don't know what happened in that scene uh, but this is their their first kind of contact as kind of an unofficial couple and you can tell that they want each other. Anyway, so Crixus says to Spartacus, your, your wife, the reason you do all this is she actually that worth it. And Spartacus says, absolutely. And so Crixus, this badass moment, he says, well, maybe there is something beyond glory. And then he puts on his gladiator helmet and he's yeah. fucking ready to fight. And so they go out. Uh, Spartacus goes out first and he gets booed to shit because, you know, the last time they saw him, he barely put up a fight against Crixus. And then Crixus comes out and Crixus gets Spanning a... Ovation. He, uh, yeah, he gets Huge a, a pop. hero's welcome. Huge pop. Uh, Champion he, of Capua. He, Yep, he said, and he says, "Capua, shall I, shall I begin?" That's like his catchphrase in the arena. And he's and then totally into out. it too. Spartacus oh, is yeah. just standing there, and Crixus is relishing it. Yep, Crixus lives for this shit. But then Theocles comes in, and Theocles <laughs> is this just his inch. Oh, this fucking, fucking bitch! Giant. <laughs> wow, Ronan. <laughs> I, I do not condone what Ronan just said. Very problematic. Uh, anyways. Theocles comes out, and he is a giant. I think, is he meant to be an, an albino in, in this? Like, I've never looked up his backstory, he, but he, his, he has incredibly his tattoo makes, pale skin and, like, His tattoo red makes eyes. me think he's a Celt, like, uh, like yeah. Anarchus is. Now, they said in the audio commentary track that the original idea for this character, they were going to make him really giant. Like, I think they actually used the phrase Lord of the Rings giant. Like, he was going to be, like, 15 feet tall. Uh, and they decided, thankfully, not to go that route because they said it would cost too much money. Um, but I was like, I like, because they said he's six foot ten. The actor is actually six foot ten. So he, he towers over Spartacus uh, and Crixus anyway. And man, yeah, the red eyes, it makes me think sort of some sort of albino. Trait. Yeah, just that's covered what I was in thinking. scars. Yeah, yeah, he's covered in scars. Well, he loves whole, to be like, cut. His, yeah, his <laughs> skin is just gnarly. Oh, and so, again, these games are being held to try to get the gods to end the drought. And as soon as these three people get into the arena, clouds start to cover the sky. And it's going to be the very important. The shadow of death. <laughs> yep. And so they fight. And Spartacus and Crixus are laying in to the shadow of death, Theocles. They are winning this fight. They they slash him multiple times, and they, they both do this big slash against across his chest, and then he goes down. And everyone is silent. Like, Body Odyssey else, yeah, actually thinks they won. <laughs> but Theocles is down, and Spartacus and Crixus just start laughing, and the crowd is cheering for them, and it looks like, you know, they, they fell this giant that's never been defeated. And then everyone goes silent, and Spartacus and Crixus have no idea what just happened, and so they turn around, and Theocles is getting up, and then Theocles yells, Shall I begin? He mocks, he steals Crixus's catchphrase, <laughs> that motherfucker. <laughs> that, that's and gimmick now, infringement, how dare he? Yeah. 
and and Onimaeus Doctore warned them about this. Like he told them, yeah. Theocles will play with you until he is ready to kill you, and so that's what happened here. Theocles was happy to let Spartacus and Crixus get little little cuts and little slashes in to uh to to fuck with them. But now he is taking this super seriously, and he starts kicking the shit out of Crixus and Spartacus. Uh, and so Crixus and Spartacus, their teamwork completely starts failing at this point, and they start getting in each other's way. Crixus starts snapping at Spartacus. Uh, and so Spartacus gets knocked down. Like, he is down on the ground for a while. And so it's a one-on-one -on -one fight between, between Theocles and Crixus. And Theocles uh, continues to kick Crixus's ass. At one point, Crixus stabs Theocles in the gut, impales him. The end of his sword is coming out of Theocles's back, and Theocles no sells this. He screams in <laughs> Crixus's face while Cri <laughs> Crixus, to it his is, credit, screams back. <laughs> it is the Godzilla versus Kong moment where Godzilla has Kong pinned down, screams at him. And, and Kong screams back, even though he's gotten a serious ass whooping. That is exactly what happens in this particular moment. This is yes. the, the, the Godzilla vs. Kong stole it from this show. I'm, I'm, we're going to go with that from now on. <laughs> okay, that works for me. So Theocles <laughs> screams in Crixus's face, knocks him back, pulls the sword out of his gut, and <laughs> is no worse for wear. It's and no then he pain starts, whatsoever. starts beating the shit out of Crixus. He slashes Crixus across the the chest, slashes him across the back, and and Crixus down on his knees with his back to Theocles, and he's looking up at you know Navia and. You can tell that you know Crixus thinks like this is it. Like I, I'm, I'm fucked. I'm gonna die. And then Spartacus saves and Spartacus yells Theocles' name. And so Theocles stops uh, messing with Crixus and starts engaging Spartacus. Spartacus uh, runs and jumps. He leaps off of the shield that Crixus is still holding, which is going to be another another thing that you see in the future. Uh, and so they start fighting. Spartacus still can't get the upper hand though, and so Crixus, as he's pushing his intestines back into his stomach, the sun starts to come boss. out, and he notices the sun reflecting off his helmet, and so he shines the he reflects the sunlight from his helmet into Theocles' eyes. Teamwork uh, to makes blind the dream work, guys. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so then Spartacus uh, impels Theocles again with one sword, grabs another sword, and just starts hacking at Theocles' neck. And and when Theocles is basically almost dead, he's got this like gaping wound in his neck. Theoc uh, Spartacus grabs the sword that he previously impaled Theocles with and uses both swords to cut Theocles' head off. And then it starts to rain. The, the drought has ended. Spartacus has become the bringer of rain. And a god that's the amongst end of the men. <laughs> Fucking great Thanks episode. For watching. I watched this episode <laughs> twice. It is so good. This is better than the thing in the pit. I mean, honestly, I think this is better in every way. And even and the thing in the pit is amazing. Um, I love this episode. I love... I love all the interplay between Crixus and Spartacus and all the ma machinations of all the various characters. Um, this is this just feels like the most tightly... Where, where the thing in the pit was more, um, hey, this is just like an exercise in brute force, right? We're just in on this sort of singular moment with, with Spartacus and having to deal with all this wave after wave of crazy you know, horrible, evil things coming at him. This felt like the very first episode where all of the plot, like you saw, you peeled away, there's so many layers to this onion and all of it, you're like, I'm invested in every single plot line going on here. There's not a single plot line now in this show that I do not want to see the resolution of. Um, and it's great. Just great. Yeah, there's, so uh, the, the, the Achilles dies. Uh, and there are only two people in the arena who are upset. Salonius is not happy, and Asher is not happy. You oh, see yeah. the shot of all all the all the other gladiators of Bodyodysus Ludus are watching, like behind this like cage door. They they're looking out, and uh, 
and everyone is so excited. Their their buddies and the Lucius have have taken down the Shadow of Death, and Asher just has this like look of dread on his face because yeah. he knows that he owes Barka thousands of, of coins at this point. Yeah. That he this is when the cannot pay off when when the the million to one sports team wins, and yeah. uh, and the bookie's like, oh fuck, there's no way I can cover all my losses here. <laughs> yep, that that's <laughs> Asher at this point. Uh, you also see, oh, uh, Ovidius is the like cousin of the magistrate who's who's running Calavicus. Is that his name? Something like that. Uh, Ovidius is his cousin, and so the magistrate, you know, before the game start, he mentions, "Hey, you know, my cousin was just killed." And Salonius is like, "Wait, what do you mean? Ovidius was killed because <laughs> Salonius hired him." And Badiatis <laughs> is like, "Yeah, I wonder what happened to that." Still, one has to wonder, you know. What sequence of events led to this? Wink, wink. It just dagger like... eyes right at him. I love though uh, Zena's look on her face because she has no idea what Body Otis did, and so like she immediately realizes, and she's just got the look of sheer terror on her face. She's like, "Oh my god! Now we're now yes. we're really into the shit." <laughs> but it was Zena's idea. Moment, like Zena was on board with this because in the last episode when body came home but they injured, talk about the Zena... kid they talk about the kid is feared dead and stuff that's when she really freaks out because it that's wasn't true. he didn't just kill ovidius he killed the, the magistrates like killed the little kid killed the yeah. wife burned the whole place to the ground yeah, he didn't yeah he didn't just kill the one guy who wronged him he went biblical and took out everyone around <laughs> i'm gonna him. kill you i'm gonna kill your family i'm gonna kill your fucking dog i'm gonna kill your fucking dogs next to ken <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, he, he, he went well and beyond so i think that's more why she was giving like the terror face yeah in the in this 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 particular episode is shot so well also like that whole sequence of body Otis with Ovidius and he's just like rubbing his the guy's little kid's hair and stuff and you're just like oh my god I mean he is John Hanna is awesome he's such an awesome actor and like you get I mean he can, he can portray funny body Otis we laugh at him uh, he can portray like terrified body Otis when he's getting the shit beat out of him in this one, it's like, okay, you don't want to fuck with this guy. Like, he's genuinely scary when he wants to be. So good. Such a great... All the villains on this show are just incredible. Yeah, it's bizarrely enough, like, like this, this, uh, this comes into play more like the next, the next season. But like, yeah, like, like all the villains are good, with the exception, I think the weakest link in the villain chain is probably the most important one of Glaber. Like, he's probably the like the lamest villain out of all of them. Glaber has not done much the last couple episodes. Yeah, he's he's even, out. even in season two. Even in season two, he's still kind of a lame villain. Like well, the, because, but that's kind of his character. It's like he he doesn't he do, he hasn't. Well, but th th this is all like this is all more important stuff. It comes into play in the second season. Anything I would be about to say. It's like at this point, it wouldn't. It's information that's not necessary. But yeah, yeah, Glaber th this is, is not the villain of this season. He is a villain of this season. But Badiatis well, is the villain of this season. I wonder yeah. if in that first episode on the commentary they said that Alithia was supposed to have a very small part, and they made it much bigger based on her performance. They made it the size of her cleavage. Yeah. I wonder I wonder if Glaber was supposed to have a much bigger presence in this, but they're like, fucking Alithia, she is way she's a way better <laughs> way better. Her villain. tits look much better than Glaber's tits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean she's great. She's a great villain. I love Alithia. But that, I mean, that begs the question, like, if, if Glaber was originally going to have a bigger role and then Alithia stole it, like, what would Glaber have done? Like, what rationale would there have been for Glaber to keep hanging around the Ludus? Was he going to go up every week uh, to be like, is Spartacus dead now? Yeah, I mean, they could have just uh, maybe done a, some sort of storyline where more pressure was being put on Badiatis from, like, the Roman elite and, and stuff it's like a, that. It's... It's a risk that could have not paid off. Like that. Like the, the bet here is that you're going to get a second season, and we know with the glory of hindsight that they get that second and third season and prequel season. But at this moment in time, they have no clue that they're going to get another season. So this is the, this is kind of a risk when you put yourself in that time frame. I was like, okay, we're going to set Glaber up for the next season, but there's not going to be a payoff to this particular arc 
yet. And it may never get one. Uh, but it, luckily, though, it pays off because the first season is great and they end up doing a lot more with it. Uh, like, also, this, uh, may, maybe, because this is, this is more references that, uh, like, Steve will understand more than Matt. Do you think this is where the Goku-Vegeta dynamic between Crixus and Spartacus more or less truly begins? Like, uh, is uh, is with this because they start to make some common ground there's clearly the rivalry and this is the moment where one guy takes over you know be, takes over being the strongest of the two uh because it's it, like Crix just uh, goes to the number two position after this and he never really comes out of it <laughs> yeah i mean that's as apt comparison as i can make this is where spartacus this is where spartacus becomes the best gladiator and yeah no. Yeah, but he doesn't Crixus become the is... flat, best gladiator without Crix's assistance. That's the thing. Oh, he does. Yeah, absolutely not. But uh, I feel like the next couple episodes, Spartacus kind of unfortunately reverts to being a dickbag. Like, he's not. He's kind of dismissive of Crixus to an extent, I think. Oh, there's but a we'll moment. There, there's a moment in this episode, and there's so much to talk about with this episode, but there's a moment again where Vero shows he's the best best human being on this entire show where him him and Spartacus are kind of like uh, hanging out like the night before the, uh, the fight with Theocles and Spartacus is like man <laughs> you know Vero's trying to pump him up right like man no one's going to beat you like you're too stubborn to die sort of thing and then you, they have that moment where Spartacus is like man it, if the gods don't favor me you know I have something I need to ask of you and, and Vero's like I will do everything I can to find your wife I will do everything I can. It's like he, Spargus didn't even have to ask. So it's it's yeah. setting up for something very sad coming up <laughs> with, with Vero and Spartacus. <laughs> um, but just that little moment, it, it it's those little moments of dialogue and character development. Because, um, yes, the show is very splashy, right? you got your sex orgies. you got your violence. And that's what people think of when they think of this show. But the key to why this show is so great is is the writing and sort of like the quiet moments between these individuals. Like um, in that scene where um, Alithia has Spartacus and, and Crixus sort of display in front of her and Lucretia. Um, if you look, at, like they cut away to, to Lucretia's face, right? When Alithia is all up on Crixus and like he's chiseled out of marble or whatever she looks like she wants to strangle Alithia <laughs> and, and you know and she has a glorious temper tantrum in another episode <laughs> but yeah. as this dynamic goes forward yeah and so but it's it's those little moments uh, of seeing the reactions and, and the actors are so good in this show that they can convey you know as an audience member exactly what they're thinking and feeling just based on their facial reactions uh, same goes for when Alithia and Crixus are having their sort of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and you just see, like, Alithia trying to compose herself, but, like, her right eye, tears just start coming out of it. And you're like, this is just good fucking acting. They don't even have to, like, when Crixus starts walking away and Navia starts taking him away, um, you just see Xena in the background crying, but they never cut to a close-up of her face. They... It's it's literally her back is to us like in the in the background of the of the scene, and you just see her. You could tell she is just bawling, just the way she's sort of convulsing, and her hands are up by her face. But we don't even need to see it. Um, it's it's such great acting, all around great acting. Yep, love it. I have nothing but positive things to say about this episode. Yep, ten out yeah, of ten yeah. for me. Yeah, that's another. So that they're of the many, many banger episodes of Spartacus, the show as a whole. Okay, let me look at my notes real quick to see uh, what I noted from the audio commentary. Oh, there's a sequence. Uh, so here are just some fun facts from the audio commentary. Uh, there's a sequence really early on when John Hanna starts to get horny for Xena. And then uh, good Salonius, of course, and the magistrate cock block him. And he walks out of the room, and he's, like, grabbing his... Dick. <laughs> I saw that too. That's so fucking good. A apparently, that was not in the script. Uh, but John Hanna, it, that was his idea to do that. But he, uh, Lucy Lawless says he did it in every single shot to make sure because he was like, that's what the character. He's got a, uh, the character would have a boner, and he's got to try to like. <laughs> 
put he's, it down. He's got to try. Bit. He's got to try. I feel and, like yeah. I feel like John Hanna probably like really did have one after that scene with Zena, though. <laughs> so it was legitimate. Yeah. Uh, Lucy Lala said that uh, one thing that she hated about the show was if you look at all the slave girls, especially when they have close-ups, they all have lip gloss on. And she, as a woman, notices, like, all of the slave girls have lip gloss, which they would not have had back in the day. And she says that was just something that kind of (laughs) always bothered her. Uh, You see, like, the close-up of Navia, like, you know, looking at Crixus deep into his eyes, and she's got bright bright lip gloss on. (laughs) Um, So there's a lot of slow motion shots in this one, and the director said something sort of interesting. He, He said that he didn't want to overuse the slow motion. He wanted to pick specific shots in which it would be more impactful. Uh, now, anybody who knows me knows that I am not a fan of slow motion. Generally speaking, I hate slow motion, but I think it was utilized really, really well, um, especially in this episode. Like, there's a great sequence when Onimaeus, uh I mean, he's got, like, no armor or anything on at this point. He just takes the two swords and whacks him in the legs, and Spartacus and Crixus go, like, flying up in the air and flipping around. Great use of slow motion, and the director mentioned like that was a moment he wanted to use it. They use a phantom uh, camera. They shot it at 400 frames per second uh, in order to slow that down. Uh, and conversely, the scene where uh, Barca kisses his boyfriend, that was shot in slow motion. Um, they had it in slow motion, but then they realized it's it, it looked too goofy, and so they actually like had to speed the footage up for that. Just <laughs> strangely enough. And then the last some frame. You will address yeah. him as the red RPM Ranger. The red RPM Ranger, okay. Uh, and the last the last uh, thing I have here, which was kind of funny, is in the scene where Alithia is, you know, has Spartacus and Crixus on display, you will notice that um, Spartacus has handcuffs on, whereas Crixus does not. And the reason why Crixus does not have handcuffs is because it was impossible for him to take off his underwear when she demands him to get naked. So they just said, the audience won't know that Crixus doesn't have handcuffs on. And so that's how Manu Bennett was able to actually remove uh, remove uh, his, whatever you call it, uh, the slave underwear that they're sort of wearing. Well, I mean, there's I a, noticed there's it another instantly. scene that happens right after that. Oh, I yeah, didn't. Well, I assume. No, that, yeah, I noticed uh, it instantly, that, even back when it came that, on. Crixus was trusted more. But, exactly. That was my thought. Was like, oh, that's a nice little bit of character. It's like Spartacus is not like they know Crixus will behave. They can't. They don't trust Spartacus. Uh, the, I thought that was. I thought that was the reason for it. I thought it was a nice bit of character. You know, like a little, little little sly character insert there. Accidental character. There's another scene. There's another scene that happens soon after this, and then we got to fucking wrap up the show. Uh, when Spartacus is talking to Bodyatus in Bodyatus' office, when when Bodyatus is telling Spartacus, "Hey, I need you to work with Crixus, or I can't help you with your wife," uh, Asher and Barkus shows up, and they're like, "Hey, you know, we have gifts, and the gift is uh, a slaver that Bodyatus is going to torture." But Spartacus is not done with the conversation. So as Bodyatus is walking away, Spartacus like grabs. Bar, uh, grabs Badiatis' arm, and Badiatis gives him this look like, are you fucking serious right well, now? Asher does, too. You see, Asher is terrified. Yeah. He's like, holy shit. Like, no, slaves don't do that. <laughs> and it, does, it doesn't turn into anything, because you can see Spartacus kind of knows, okay, I took this too far. Let me, Spartacus, back away a little bit. Like, let me, let me, you know... Just let Badiatis go, and then we'll never speak to this game. But that is such a great fucking scene. That yeah. look that John Hanna gives him is amazing. Yeah. Acting, man. It's all the acting. It's all the acting. So, final thoughts, Ronan. Do you have any anything else you'd like to say about this episode? No, no. It's another, it's another solid banger. It's a good one. Uh, you know, un- unless we want to pad the runtime by uh, like having you talk a little bit about Manu Bennett's penis, do, do you want do you want to say anything about it, Matt? I know I know you're a fan. Oh, I I what I what I love about this looks show. Good. Yeah, looks fine to me. <laughs> good for um, him. <laughs> what I what I think is interesting about this show um, is that I I think the. <sighs> When people think of Spartacus uh, and they've, they've never really watched it, they just think, oh, it's just a bunch of, you know, naked women running around. 
right? In crazy sex scenes. Like, no, this show gives plenty of time to, to naked men running around, full frontal, and good on Manu Bennett. Uh, I, for, I had forgotten how much, like, full frontal nudity he does in this show, and I was just kind of like, geez, again? <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, like we mentioned that. I mentioned it as a joke, but I do Guys, like. But go that all does. this hand. Don't look at your cards. <laughs> okay. But it's that, that does. Time. I, I do like that. Does make me think about like Steve mentioned that they like Spartacus and Crixus have yet another fight, and uh, like like the, it, that fight they are full naked. It, like they are full nude. It's yep. tip to tip. Has their like struggling around on the ground, and it's like that's that's an awkward thing. To like you know have to you know script and do as actors, but like yeah, I was, like it, but it's a it's another good moment of just like sheer rage that comes out of them. Yeah, I mean this shows equal opportunity, um, and I'm fine. I have no problem with it. So you know if if someone's uncomfortable with it, like I mean that's a you problem. Who cares? Um, but <laughs> yeah, so. That's it, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to another episode of Jupiter's Croc. Next week, we are going to be back with uh, the episode yes. Delicate Things, Fuck. number six. And Steve why do just I keep doing this? took all of our why? money. I busted because why great. do I keep doing this? <laughs> I'm only down to 1.2 million chips, fellas. Um, so thanks again for listening. Uh, leave a comment. What would you guys think of uh, Shadow Games with Theocles? as imposing and impressive as they sort of built him up. Uh, I definitely think so. Um, I'd love to see a show just about Theocles running around doing his stuff. Um, but we'll catch you next week. And cut. All right, catch you guys.